Good afternoon. Today we shall be discussing John Donne's poem, The Sun Rising. The Sun Rising, which is variously spelled as The Sun Rising with A C U double N E, is a thirty-line poem with three stanzas, published in sixteen thirty-three by the poet John Donne. The meter of the poem is irregular. ranging from 2 to 6 stresses per line in no fixed pattern the longest lines are at the end of the three stanzas and the rhyme never varies each stanza running with the rhyme scheme a b b a c d c d e e in the first stanza of the poem The sun is an authority figure ridiculed for his impatience with the slow and seemingly unprofitable dalliance of love. He is apostrophized as an old man, influential and rich. Supposedly, his age gives him a worldly wisdom the lovers lack, but which they in fact surpass. In the first four lines, he is a spoiler disturbing the couple through windows and through curtains of their bed traditionally the sun at dawn figures newness a beginning or even possibly a rebirth but here dawn ironically casts him as crabbed and unruly old man eager to count the day's receipts Voyeurist moralist the son is described as a saucy pedantic wretch scolding tardy schoolboys and hurrying reluctant apprentices to their shows both groups soon to compose his world's force further scrutinizing the son's terrestrial influence dun capitalizes on the symbolic associations of the son with royalty he must go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride from king to kingdom calling country ants to harvest offices the sun becomes a reeve as it were stimulating the economy of the animal world as it does in the human one education commerce royal command nature's growing cycle are all summoned to work under the sun's demands Yet at the same time, the sun's authority is apparently diminished. His subjects are lethargic and choleric. Sour is the word Dunn uses. Out of step with his quickly moving pace, each must be harnessed to the duty he imposes. It is inevitable that the sun's influence suffers from the very fidelity to time and service, which earns him revenue and untoward respect. unlike love's generosity holding none to specific season clime hours days and months the niggard sun dresses his laborers in the rags of time love exacts no such drudgery but clothes his followers luxuriously dun and his lover to emphasize the point are richly surrounded by amorous covers the embossed curtains of their bed and the passionate sheets under which they lie the economic and political characteristics associated with the sun in the first stanza recurring the second and again a subject to love stones but here dun demonstrates the assimilating power of love its ability to take and thereby enrich itself from the sun This luminary, whose beams are imagined as so reverend and strong, to quote Dun, thus suggesting this venerable authority is wiped out by a lover's intangible wing, hardly comparable in the world's view to those assets of the sun which Dun has described. But even a wing takes long, for as Dun boasts, "I would not lose her sight so long." The sun is depicted as a hoarder of wealth, having both the Indias of spice and wine in his possession. 
But, says Dan, these treasures will not be there tomorrow. Instead, they will be transferred to the lover's bed here with me, he says. The son is not the master of his own destiny. He is fated to move incessantly, unlike the stationary lovers whose permanence bestows superiority. Permanently transferred to the lover's kingdom, these two related geographically balanced places, the East and West Indies, can serve as implied comparisons for parts of his lady's body. The bright and dazzling wealth of the Indies might suggest her eyes, now brighter than the sun that richly warmed these places. After all, Dunn invites the sun to look on them if her eyes have not blinded thine. Or possibly the two Indies represent her breasts, a likely compliment coming from the author of Elegy 19, who similarly praises his naked mistress as mine of precious stones, my empery. Wealth and the glitter associated with jewels are applied to the beauty of the moment Dan embraces in bed. Her body, through the geographic comparison, is the treasure trove of love's new world. The sun will lose other assets to the lovers. In line 19 of the poem, he is characterized as a king in his own right. Dan tells him that if the son asks for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, they will be gone. His earthly compeers, who doubtless admit the son as the celestial equivalent, will succumb as he must, their kingdom subsumed by the lover's bed. Without the assistance of mortal kings who make their subjects, apprentices or court huntsmen, labor, the son will inevitably forfeit wealth and jeopardize the homage paid to him. Worldly fortune is again metamorphosed into amorous treasure through the love and the power of Dan's love metaphors. All here in one bed lay, as Dan says, and again at the son's expense. Love's inclusive powers are repeatedly emphasized through Dan's use of all in lines 9, 20, and 21 of the poem. In the third stanza, the son who formerly gave commands now must take instructions from the lovers. Since they own all things of worth, the son must serve them. They must become his new world, and he and those who depended on him for wealth must correspondingly obey the lover's rules. She is all states and all princes, I, nothing else is, Dan says. Princes, the son's former associates, crassly imitate or play the lovers. The world must change values thanks to a witty vote face. In the material world, the paragons of society possessed wealth and power. They were imitated and flattered for these gifts. But now, since love runs the universe and is the determiner of success, sex becomes the honored standard of evaluation to which princes must adhere. The amorous implications of the verb play underscored the shift in allegiance. Dan says, Rulers must turn lovers if they want to flourish in this world. Compared to this, all honors mimic. The demonstrative pronoun this refers to the powerful act of love which has taken place in Dan's bed. Worldly honor, a code of ethics based on individual merit in royal service, is a pale substitute, as it were, for the mutual joys of love. The sexual implications here look forward to the resolution expressed a few lines later in the poem. Dan lunch launches further assaults on the son's favored rich. The wealth of princes formerly linked to the son is now branded in line 24 as alchemy, false and worthless. This comparison is one of the most important in the poem in terms of the decreasing influence of the son and the increasing power of love. The close association of the son with the pseudoscience of alchemy, a common place in Renaissance literature, 
further hints at the son's erring friendship, wit and service to those who covet earthly lucre and rule. In contrast, solar participation in the alchemical process is honored by Shakespeare, for example, in Shakespeare's Sonnet No. 33, where the sun is metaphorically seen as gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. Or in Paradise Lost, where Milton praises the archchemic sun in Book 3. Dunn obviously intends no such tribute in his poem The Sun Rising, or for that matter in Love's Alchemy, but instead reveals the sun's ephemeral wealth. The alchemy in which the sun's participation is seen could never have granted exclusive use of such wealth as the minds mentioned in the previous stanza themselves transformed into the permanent riches praised in Dunn's bed. The last six lines of the poem resolve the sun's problem as well as the lover's conflict with him. If the sun wants to be a part of the world he once oversaw, he must shine in one spot only, the lover's bedroom, and for all times. Only then will he be happy and at ease. He will be fully, not half, happy because he will no longer be confined to just one hemisphere at a time, the two lovers forming one group themselves thus provide a unique alternative to a world that is contracted thus. And the sun will be at ease since he will not have to travel to light both hemispheres. By remaining stationary, the sun will henceforth remove the chief cause of aging and corruption, which is movement. The pleasure of rest applies to the lovers as well as the sun. In having the sun shine forever on the lovers, Dunn reveals how previous material benefits from the sun are now translated into sexual terms for the lovers. The sun must now employ his power not to make ephemeral wealth but to participate in everlasting love. A constant sun warming a pair of constant lovers forbids infidelity and thus grants endless pleasure and warmth. Love's treasure indeed. The heat of the sun mingles with the passions of the lovers, here made particular with the palm, therefore unnoted on Dunn's name in line 28, where Dunn says, to warm the world that Dunn is warming us. The relevance of the pun is ensured when we consider that the poem was written shortly after Dunn's marriage and that what the sun warms the entire world, it is literally done, that is done and his wife. The us in the same line is synonymous with the world, for as the next line boasts, and Dan says, shine here to us and thou art everywhere. If the changes wrought for the lovers are incomprehensibly delightful, the transformation for the sun is no less rewarding. Accepting the lover's invitation, he will participate in a far richer and more reliable quest for wealth than that ever promised or accomplished by earthly alchemy. The extraordinary goals of alchemy than that ever promised or accomplished by the lovers who transform base metals, time easily lost treasure, into the pure which is eternity comprising of permanent riches is one of the highlights of this poem. This new alchemy, welcoming the son's participation, must focus exclusively on his helping the lovers in the process of regeneration because of love. The rebirth and newness expected from but not granted by the son in the first stanza are thus assured in the last line of the poem. The crucial change is signaled by the shortest but most significant journey of the son's career. He moves from being a greedy and officious busybody outside of the lover's room into a partner in the procreative celebration taking place inside their room. This bed thy center is, Dan says, these walls thy sphere. At the center of the room is the lover's bed and with the sun shining directly on it, the regenerative force of his beams 
no longer mocked for their previously faulty deeds, can work uninterrupted and pure. The sun becomes an agent of fertility in a sense, in a timeless, complete and always productive world. The sun rising effectively is Dan's wry answer to those who think that love is unprofitable and lovers indolent bankrupts. He pays tribute to love's wealth by contrasting it with the transient gifts of a material world linked to the sun. Through his metaphors, inspired by love, Dan creates his own new and richly endowed world.